After having discussed the Z transform techniques in the last few lectures, we shall now look at a few examples illustrating the typical application of Z transforms to the solution of difference equations pertaining to discrete time systems. Let us first take an example which which pertains to the model of a discrete time system shown here. This is the input xn that is a multiplier half given to an adder and that is the output yn and the output is delayed by one unit. put through a multiplier again, coefficient multiplier, again with coefficient multiplier has a value half and then this is given to the adder here. So this then is the model of a discrete time system. Now let us form the difference equation for this and then find out its solution using the Z-transform approach. If this is yn, this is yn minus 1. Therefore, the signal that is fed to the adder here is half of yn minus 1. The other signal that is fed to the adder is half of xn. So very clearly, the output yn equals one half of xn, that is the signal coming here, plus one half of yn minus 1, that is the signal coming here. Now this is the difference equation and as we already observed, we need to have an appropriate auxiliary condition for the solution of the difference equation. Let the condition be given, let y of minus 1 be given as minus 1. So this is the auxiliary condition, we may call that initial condition or auxiliary condition, we will call that initial condition. So since this is a first order difference equation, we need to have one initial condition and this is what is given. Now to use the Z-transform technique for the solution of the difference equation, let us say the Z-transform of Yfn, let us indicate this as Yz. Then, What is the Z-transform of y n minus 1? y n minus 1, is the signal is delayed by one instant of time, so you would have written Z minus 1 yz. This would be true if it is a purely causal signal. But then we are given the specification that y minus 1 is minus 1. So if I have y n, this is y n. We also have a value here at minus 1, its value is minus 1, that is also given to us. Therefore, when you delay this by one unit, you have this minus 1 sitting here plus the other values. Therefore, this also must be taken into account and therefore you must add to this the value of the signal multiplied by z power minus 0, which is 1 of course, therefore you must also, the value of the signal is minus 1, therefore minus 1 which is y minus 1, that has to be added. 
we also that means what we are trying to do is find the z transform of each one of these terms and then form the equation so z transform of xn let this be x of z so in z transform domain we have 1 minus y z minus half you transform to the other side half z minus 1 y of z equals half of x of z plus the other term which is remaining here when you make the z transform of half y n minus 1 you also have a minus 1 here and that is multiplied by half therefore minus half this will be the equation corresponding to the difference equation in z transform domain this is a purely algebraic equation no note that a difference equation is converted into an algebraic equation just like in the continuous time case a differential equation is converted into an algebraic equation in the transform domain now for to solve for this we need also have some information about xn so let this also the, the additional data given here let xn be un so we want to find out the output corresponding to a unit step input therefore this will be half of z upon z minus 1 that is the z transform of a unit step minus 1 therefore that will turn out to be half of one upon z minus one so if you solve for y of z from this algebraic equation you can show that y of z turns out to be i will uh, not go through the, all the intermediate steps half z over z minus one times z minus half that is the <coughs> z transform of the output quantity so to make the partial fraction expansion i will form yz upon z to start with therefore this is half of z minus 1 multiplied by z minus half and uh, that turns out to be 1 over z minus 1 minus half 1 over z minus 0.5 consequently yz will be z upon z minus 1 minus z upon z minus 0.5 so each of these is the z transform of a well known discrete time function therefore y of n can be written as this is un of course unit step this is 0.5 raised to the power of n here so that is the solution for y of n how does this function look like you have the unit step from that you have 0.5 times n which gradually so it, when n equals 0 this is 1 and this is also 1 to start with it is 0 0 1 minus 1 0 and ultimately for large values of n this becomes insignificantly small and asymptotically it rises to a value 1 therefore you will have something like this so you have samples gradually reaching a value 1. So that is your solution for y n. The envelope for this curve would be by the form 1 minus 0.5 n. So that is the solution for your uh, in this particular problem where we have a first order difference equation. Now let us take a second example. Let us now consider as a second example a ladder network which has a value all resistors equal to r ohms in this configuration let us say at, at this is one end of the ladder so the effective resistance seen here i will call that r1 so look into the right what is the effective resistance seen at this point is r1 now the second 
step, say let us say this is node 1, this is node 2, this is node 3 and there are all together let us say n nodes. These are the node numbers. So the res effective resistance seen to the at node 2 for the circuit to the right of it is R2. So let us say similarly this is R3. And finally, this resistance in here, let us be Rn. Now it's clear that as far as R1 is concerned, this is equal to R itself. R2 is <laughs> the effective resistance in here is 2R in parallel with R. So 2R times R divided by 3R or 2 by 3R, 2 upon 3R. R3 likewise is, this is what you see here is 2 by 3R plus R in series, that means 5 by 3, 5 upon 3R, 5 upon 3R in parallel with R, that means 5 by 3, R times R divided by 1 plus 5 by 3 times R, so it becomes 5 upon 8 R. So you observe an interesting feature of the values of the effective resistance as we progress towards the nth node. I can call this R times 1 by 1 or 1 upon 1. So I can write this as a matter of fact, 1 upon 1 times R. I do this to see a certain pattern in this. The sum of these two numbers is equal to this. 2 plus 3 equals 5. And the last two numbers, 5 plus 3 is equal to 8. So as we progress, we have a sequence of numbers where the sequence goes like this. 1, 1, 2, 3, then 5, then 8. And the next number would be 13, of course. And so on and so forth, where each number is the sum of the preceding two numbers. So in order to keep this particular form, we can also say the previous number is 0, so that 0 plus 1 equals 1. So such a sequence of numbers is generated, and the effective resistance is given in terms of the ratio of two appropriate successive integers. Now, going in this fashion, the effective resistance seen here, as you can see, when you are talking about R3 is 5 upon 8. So if I can call these numbers as k1 by k2 times r, where I can define k0 as 0, k1 equals 1. These numbers, I'm writing this as k0, k1, k2, etc., etc. This, this will be k3 upon k4 times r, and this will be k5 divided by k6 times r. And naturally, this would be written as k2n minus 1 divided by k2n. Because at the third node, you have k5 over k6. This is k2n power 1 by k2n. So this is a sequence of numbers. And in, by the way, such sequence of numbers where each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers is known as a Fibonacci sequence or Fibonacci numbers, Fibonacci sequence of numbers. And interestingly, in a ladder network with all equal resistances, then the effective resistance at any particular node can be expressed in terms of this Fibonacci sequence numbers. But we would like to find out a general expression for KN. That is the problem that we have on hand. So what we observe, therefore, is that we have Kn plus 2 equals Kn plus 1 plus Kn. So this is the difference equation pertaining to these Fibonacci numbers, Kn plus 1 plus Kn. So this is a difference equation, and we would like to solve this using the Z-transform approach. This is a second-order difference equation. Therefore, 
we need to have two initial conditions and we use this as the initial conditions. Let us see now. So if these are the numbers, we will carry up the Z transform of that, we will put as Kz. Then Kn plus 1, that means you are advancing the signal, it is Kz times Kz, but in forming Z times Kz, one of these K0 would have gone to the for negative direction and that is lost. Therefore, you must write this for, uh, you, you must write this minus z times k0. That's what you are having. For kn plus 2, again, you are pushing it in the negative direction. Therefore, not z square kz, but the samples k0 and k1, uh, because I write this as k0 here, I will write simply K0. So K0 and K1 have been transferred in the for negative in the negative part of the x-axis. Therefore, they are lost, and therefore that has to be repaired. So Z squared K0 minus Z of K1. So that is how the Z transforms of Kn, Kn plus one, and Kn plus two look like. Observe here in this particular example, the independent variable is no longer time, so it may not be a proper thing to call this a discrete time system. But the same methodology will be valid. The independent variable now is a position, the, the index of the node, 1, 2, 3, n. So except for that minor difference, the entire the techniques that we have at our disposal can be used for this. It is not a discrete time system, but the independent variable has discrete values. So it similar to a discrete time system. So once we have this, we substitute this in the, we transform this equation, therefore you have Z squared KZ minus Z squared K0 minus Z K1 equals, that is the Z transform of this. Z transform of this is Z KZ minus Z K0 plus the Z transform of this, which is KZ. So collecting terms which involve KZ, so you have Z squared minus Z minus 1 multiplying kz equals k0 is 0. So we don't have to worry about that. This is 0. And zk1, k1 equals 1. Therefore, that is. So you have kz equals z upon z squared minus z plus 1. So that is the z transform of the nth Fibonacci number Km. So we must find the inverse Z transform to find out what Km would be. So for this purpose, we must make the partial fraction expansion again and find out uh, the poles corresponding to this. So to do the partial fraction expansion of this, we will first of all divide right through by Z according to our practice. So Z squared minus Z plus 1. Let me say this is equal to alpha over z minus p1 plus beta over z minus p2, where p1 and p2 are the poles of this rational function. We can work this out and can show that p1 equals 1 plus root 5 upon 2, p2 equals 1 minus root 5 upon 2, and furthermore, alpha equals 1 upon root 5 and beta equals minus 1 upon root 5. So the result is that we can write k of z as 1 upon root 5 times z upon z minus p1 plus minus z upon z minus p2. Because alpha and beta are negative, therefore this minus sign comes into the picture. Finding out the inverse z transform of this, you, the kn, 
the nth number in the Fibonacci sequence will turn out to be 1 over root 5 p1 raised to the power of n minus p2 raised to the power of n. Of course, this is valid for n greater than or equal to 0. And this is 1 over root 5, root 5 plus 1 by 2 raised to the power of n minus 1 minus root 5 by 2 raised to the power of n. And once you have the general expression, this is the nth Fibonacci number, even though you seem to have a lot of the square root signs come, coming here, it will turn out to be, when you work it out, it will turn out to be an integer. And the Rn that we are looking for, the effective resistance seen at this end, at the nth node, which is K2n minus 1 by K2n, can now be written as divided by root 5 plus 1 by 2 raised to the power of 2n minus 1 minus root 5 by 2 raised to the power of 2n. That is the expression for Rn. So we can find out the effective resistance for a general value of n using this particular expression. Now let us see what happens for a long ladder when the n becomes very large. So limit as n tends to infinity of Rn, that means a very large ladder network. 1 minus root 5 by 2 is a number smaller than unity in magnitude. Therefore, for large values, this drops out. So essentially, it is the ratio of these two quantities. Therefore, this becomes this quantity divided by this raised to the power of 2n, that means 1 over root 5 plus 1 divided by 2, or 2 over root 5 plus 1. This can alternately be written as root 5 minus 1 divided by 2. And this value is 0.618. This is a, an interesting number. This is sometimes called the golden ratio or golden mean. One can look at it this way. Suppose I have a straight line, and I want to divide the straight line into two parts, such that the ratio of the smaller section to the larger section, that is n over m, is also equal to the, the length of the larger section to the whole length, that is m over m plus n. So, for, so you want to divide a straight line in this fashion that the ratio of the smaller length to the larger section is the same as the ratio of the larger section to the whole length, then it turns out that n by m once again turns out to be 0.618. And the classical painters and architects apparently believed that this is a ratio which has the most pleasing proportions. So in the classical paintings, paintings you find that this particular ratio is used to form the frame for a painting. That means this is 0.618, this is 1. Architects also used to have this kind of configuration, this kind of ratio for doorways and so on and so forth. So if you have some columns like this, in Greek architecture and so on, the opening will have bearing this ratio. So it turns, this has got, this is a matter of interesting detail for us to know that this particular ratio, what is called golden ratio, is supposed to present a rectangle of the most pleasing proportion. We'll leave it at that. Let us now consider, as a third example, the application of the Z-transform technique to the solution of a general second-order difference equation. Let us consider one form, form A, let us say, where 
the independent variable starts with n and goes up to n plus 2. So we can write y n plus 2 plus a1 y n plus 1 plus a2 y n equals b0 x n plus b1 x n minus 1 plus b, I am sorry, since we start with n plus 2 here, we may as well have b0 x n plus 2 plus b1 x n plus 1 plus b2 x n. That is a general form of the second order difference equation. You might ask why did I not put a0? Even if we had a0, we can rewrite right through by a0 and end up with this form. So this is the most general form. We do not have to put a0. Specifically, a0 can always be regarded as 1. Now, let us z, make the z transform of each one of these terms. We have yn plus 2. We have z squared yz for this, z squared yz. Suppose this z transform of yn is yz. Therefore, this is z squared yz. Since you are advancing this, you have lost one sample corresponding to y0, this term corresponding to y0, and also y1, so z y1. This is something which we have been talking about. Plus, the z transform of this is a1 times z y z, and the sample corresponding to y0 here had been lost because we are pushing this in the ad advancing this, that means you are pushing that particular sample at a to n equals minus 1 position, therefore z y0 plus a2 yz. That is this. This is equal to, likewise, we carry out the same operation here, b0 times z squared xz minus z squared x0 minus z squared minus z times x1 plus b1 times x z times xz minus z times x0 plus b2 times x sub z. So that is how it goes. Now collecting the terms corresponding to x sub z and uh, y sub z and terms corresponding to y0, y1, x0 and x1 separately, you can show that this is will be equal to z squared plus a1z plus a2 multiplied by y of z equals b0 z squared plus b1z plus b2 x of z plus z squared plus a1z times y0 plus z y1 plus minus b0 z squared plus b1z times x1 x0 minus b0 z times x1. So in the transform domain, this is how the algebraic equation would look like connecting xz and yz and the initial conditions. So one possibility is, suppose you take case 1, when you have a second order equation given like this, starting with yn and going to yn plus 2, a conventional and useful way in which the initial conditions are prescribed are y0 and y1. So given y0 and y1, these are the initial conditions. And of course, the xn is prescribed, so we certainly will know what x0 and x1 is. Solve for yz and hence deduce yn. 
So that is the way in which we can at attack this problem. Once we have got y0 and y1, these are the initial conditions. This is second order difference equation. We need to know two initial conditions. x of n is, go is given to us. So x0 and x1 is known, and also x of z. So everything is known except yz. You can solve for yz and hence deduce y1. Now suppose, suppose we are given not y0 and y1, suppose y minus 1 and y minus 2 are given. Let y minus 1 and y minus 2 be given. Then we can deduce, we can then deduce y0 and y1. How? Because after all, we need to know y0 and y1. So given these conditions, we can deduce y0 and y1, put n equals minus 2 in the original equation, put n equals minus 2, then we have in this original equation, yn plus 2, a1, yn minus 1, a2, yn. In this, put n equals minus 2, you get y0 plus a1, y minus 1, plus a2, y minus 2, and so on and so forth. So put n minus 2 in the original difference equation, you get y0 plus a1, y minus 1, plus a2, y minus 2, equals b2, x minus 2, plus b1, x minus 1, plus b0, x0. Similarly, put n equals minus 1, then you can get a similar way, y1 plus a1 y0 plus a2 y minus 1 equals b2 x minus 1 plus b1 x0 plus b0 x1. P not x1. Now, normally you are given an input x of n starting from n equal 0 and we assume that the input is a causal signal, therefore we can take this to be 0. zero. And now you have, you are given y1 minus 1 and y minus 2, you got two equations, you can solve for y0 and y1 solve for y0 and y1 and use this information to find out y of z in this equation. So it does not mean necessarily therefore that the initial conditions are given to you always y0 and y1 even if y minus 1 and y minus 2 that is if you are given the input conditions initial conditions before the excitation is applied that's what we are having here. If the initial conditions are, are the values of the dependent variable before the excitation xn is applied, even that information will be useful for us to calculate y0 and y1 and then we can solve for this. So that these are variations in each possible in the different problems. We may give initial conditions in the form y0 and y1 or by y minus 1, y minus 2, then also we can solve for this. But the point to note here is y minus 1 and y minus 2 are the initial conditions before the excitation is applied. So xn starts from n equals 0, that is, the, that is the one way in which it is given and that also will be able, enable us to solve the problem. Now, a important case arises where initial conditions prior to application of input R0. You recall when we talked about transfer functions and so on in the continuous time situation, we said if the initial conditions are zero prior to the application of the input, then there is a proportionality relationship between the output and input in this transform domain. Similarly here, we have a causal signal, xn is zero for n less than zero, and the xn is applied at n equal zero onwards, and all the initial conditions are zero before the input is applied. Therefore, y minus 1 equals 
y minus 1, y minus 2 are also equal to 0. So if this is the condition, if y minus 1 and y minus 2 are 0 and this is 0, so if y naught equals b naught x naught and y1 equals b1 x naught x1, under these conditions you can show that this entire thing will vanish. You can then show that this entire expression r equals to by substituting these values, so y minus 1, y minus 2 is 0, y naught therefore is equal to b naught x naught and y1 equals b1 x naught plus b naught x1. Substituting those values into this, you can show that this quantity exactly equals this quantity and therefore the entire r is wiped out. We have yz over xz equals b naught z squared plus b1 z plus b2 divided by z squared plus a1 z plus a2. So we now have instead of a difference equation connecting yn and xn in the transform domain we have a pure ratio of yz over xz is b naught z squared plus b1 z plus b2 over z squared plus a1 z plus a2. So provided the initial conditions are zero prior to the application of the input, the transforms of the output and the input in the z-transform domain are related by a pure ratio like this. Now how do we get this ratio? You recall that this is the equation which we started out with, second order difference equation yn plus 2a1 yn plus 1 plus a2 yn and so on. So in operator form this would be how it will be e squared plus a1e plus e2, a2 operating on yn equals b naught e squared plus b1e plus b2 operating on xn. So in this expression, if we the, the substitute the operator e by z, then the ratio of y to x would be simply this, that is z squared, <coughs> b naught z squared plus b1z plus b2 divided by z squared plus a1z plus a2. So that means if we have a difference equation to start with, to find out the ratio of the z-transforms in is quite easy. All you have to do is substitute the operator e by the variable z. That's all, that's all it entails. Now, in this particular form a, we have n ranging from n to n plus 2. Now, let us consider the second case where second order difference equation still, but n ranges from n to n minus 2. Let us see what the similar ratio, what type of result we get in this form B. In the previous form, if you decrement the independent variable n by 2 units, you get an alternative form which can be put yn plus a1 y n minus 1 plus a2 y n minus 2 equals b naught xn plus b1 xn minus 1 plus b2 xn. Now, in this case, a natural form in which initial conditions are prescribed will be corresponding to y minus 1 and y, y minus 1 and y minus 2. That is n equals minus 1 and n equals minus 2. So once again, trying to take the transform of each term, term by term, and then recognizing that now we are delaying and therefore when you are delaying this function n minus 1, the sample which is standing earlier at n equals minus 1 is coming to the 0 position and that has to be taken into account. So given y minus 1 and y minus 2, let us say this is case 1 given y1 minus 2, we can and assuming that x minus 1 and x minus 2 are 0, we can find out the equation relating to y and x in the transform domain, you can find this out and they can show that y of z will be times 1 plus a1z minus 1 plus a2z minus 2 equals b naught plus b1z minus 1 plus 
uh, I should write here x n minus 2, b2 x n, x n, n minus 1, n minus 2, plus b2 z minus 2 times x sub z plus corresponding to the initial conditions, you have z minus 1, b2 x minus 1 minus a2 y minus 1 plus b2 x minus 2 plus b1 x minus 1 minus a2 y minus 2 minus a1 y minus 1. That's what you are having, z minus 1. So if y1 minus 1 and y minus 2 are given and either you assume that x minus 1 and x minus 2 are 0 for a causal signal or even if it is specified you know their values. So given this solve for yz and hence find yz. So the procedure is straightforward. Now suppose y1 and y2 are given. If y1 and y2 are given, or I am sorry, y0 and y1, we have y minus 1 and y minus 2, alternately y0 and y1 are given, put n equals 0 and n equals 1 in the deduce in the difference equation and deduce y minus 1 and y minus 2. You can do that by putting n equals 0 and then equals my 1 here and can deduce these values. And once you have got y minus 1 and minus 2, you can proceed in this fashion. The important thing here as before is if there are 0 initial conditions, before the application of the input, a causal signal. So we assume that xn is 0 for n less than 0 and y minus 1, y minus 2 are also 0. Then you look going to here, x minus 1 is 0, y minus 1 is 0, x minus 2, x minus 1, y minus 2, y minus 1, all these are 0 and you have straight away yz over xz would be, will be yz over xz will be b naught plus b1 z power minus 1 plus b2 z power minus 2 divided by 1 plus a1 z power minus 1 plus a2 z power minus 2. So that is the ratio of the output to the input in z transform domain in form B. Notice that this is the form that we got in form A. This pertains to form A and what we have obtained here is the ratio in form B. If you look at these two expressions closely, you will observe that both are the same. One is can be derived from the other by dividing by z square or multiplying by z square, both the numerator and denominator. So both are essentially the same. That means whether you take the difference equation ranging from n to n minus 2 or n to n plus 2, this is a second order difference equation, both are the same. Since the difference equations are the same, the ratio of the transforms also must be the same and the ratio of the z transform of the output to the z transform of the input with zero initial conditions is what is called a system function in much the same way as we have in the continuous time case. But in this situation, these two are called discrete time system functions. So both are the same, this is called discrete time system function and we abbreviate this, do the symbol hz for this. Now the, let me once again mention that the discrete time system function is defined as the z transform of the output to the z transform of the input with zero initial conditions prior to the application of the input. To derive the discrete time system function from the difference equation, 
is almost trivial because once you set up the difference equation, you use the operator E and by substituting Z for E, you simply get the ratio of the two polynomials in Z and that is the discrete time system function. And what we have done for the second order case can be extended to a higher order case in more or less the same way. No difference at all. So in the, in the higher order case, the polynomials of the operator F, E and G, E will be uh, of a higher order. Therefore, the corresponding numerator and denominator in the system function will also be of higher order. So after having studied how to find the system function for a second order situation and how the same procedure can be extended to higher order systems also, let us now look at the properties of the system function in a general way. So what are the properties of H of Z? That's what we'll take up next. Let us think of this as a single input, single output discrete time system. And we assume zero initial conditions. When we mean zero initial conditions, it is implied that the conditions are zero before the application of the input. That means y minus 1, y minus 2, and all these are zero, provided this is a causal signal. And in a general case, the yn and xn may be connected by nth order differential equation, where capital N is involved. So this is a nth order differential equation, difference equation, and this is in this form. And from what we have discussed in the second order case, it can easily be shown that with zero initial conditions and with this nth order differential equation, and difference equation, yz over xz is simply can be written as b naught z power n z power capital N plus b1 z n minus 1 down the line to b n divided by coming from here a naught z power n plus b1 z power n minus 1 and so on. Sorry, this is a1 and goes up to a n. So that is, and this is what we call h of z, the discrete time system function. Which corresponds to what we have done in the continuous time case, that the ratio of z transforms or the output to the input with zero initial conditions. Even if we had written down the difference equation in alternative form, starting with a y n, a 1 y n minus 1, and like that, a n y n minus capital N and so on, you would end up with the same difference equation, same final form of h of z. What are the properties of the system function? First, h of z is let me repeat this, z transform of the output quantity by the z transform of the input quantity with zero initial conditions prior to the application of the input. Prior to application of input. It's obvious, that's the definition. Second point, of course, with zero initial conditions, once again, yz equals h of z times x of z. This is just repeating, but putting it in alternative fashion. A third point is, if xn happens to be a unit impulse, then xz, of course, is equal to 1, and therefore yz is h of z. So the if, if delta n produces hn as the impulse response, then that impulse response has a z transform h of z. Therefore, h of z is z transform of impulse response. And therefore, you can see that yz is equal to hz to some xz. So in time domain, yn equals hn convolved with xn, which is something which you already know. 
Once you know the impulse response, the response to any input can be obtained by the convolution of the impulse response and the input we get y of n. So we now find that even here we have the same situation. Same the x of z is the z transform of the impulse response. The fourth point which I would like to mention is if the xn happens to be wn, then the force response first response will turn out to be h of w times wn because this is a characteristic signal and therefore the output also will have the same type of behavior. It will be h w times wn which we will see uh, in the next lecture and then proceed from then on. So the system function plays a very important role in, uh, in discrete time systems just as it did in the case of continuous time systems and we will talk more about this later in the next lecture.